I want you to see that there's a search for a few good men, and we've all seen the posters and uh, know in our mind we've seen uh, the call as the years have gone down. Let's look at verse 9. Second Chronicles, I'm in First Chronicles, what am I doing there? Second Chronicles 16, verse 9, let's see. It says this, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth to show Himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward Him. And then he continues on about uh, Asa's failure here. He says, Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Thou shalt have wars. We all, again, at one time or another, have seen the old military posters, and many of us, we look at and we see Uncle Sam in our mind's eye. He's sitting over that big, bold, red, white, and blue hat, and he's got that finger pointed out. It says, we want you, right? We know the commercials. I remember uh, thinking about the military. Many of my family uh, have all served in the military in one form or another. You know, I have members of my family who fought in the Civil War. I have members of my family who's fought in the Second World War. Probably the First World War, if I can get down to the, the matter of it. But I know for certain the Second World War, the Korean conflict and uh, Vietnam War, I have members who fought in that and others through, through down through the history. But, uh, you know, I was thinking about those commercials that we've seen growing up. Uh, the, Marine, the few, the proud, the Marines. And, and on and on down we can go. When we're searching for a few good men, we could go down and we could think about it, think as we go down and look at Newberry, and they got constantly got that sign, the, the police sign that says, we're looking for more officers. Because the crime is rampant. Because there's just nobody answering the call. We think about the kids who are in the street, they're just looking for a few good fathers. We're looking for the churches who have congregations and they're looking for a few good pastors. I mean, we're looking for a few good men everywhere that we turn. It's more than just a slogan. It's a duty of which we're called to, uh, and, and we need to be answering the call. Now, I think that it's safe to say that God, uh, too, is looking for a few good men. The call is revealed. The course or the cause is righteous. The quality is rare, and our world promotes the idea of a successful man. Right. Our world promotes the idea of a brave man, a successful man, a skillful man. The world promotes the idea of a man who has all of it together. He's handsome, he's strong, he's brave. I mean, he has everything. It's all outward, this, that, or the other. And really, I think that's what Samuel was looking for when he went to go out and anoint the next man that God was going to choose. God had to look at Samuel and say, God, you know, many men look, men look at the outward appearance, but God looketh upon the heart. This is what we find here. This is what God is looking for, a man who's sold out instead of a sellout. God's not speaking here of those who are sinlessly perfect, of course, but He's looking for those who have a single devotion. He's not... He's not scattered abroad. He's not one day serving the Lord and giving His heart to, to doing everything, to serving, to worshiping, to doing all that God has called Him to do in whatever service or capacity that it is. One day He's serving the Lord and then the next day He says, well, maybe, uh, you know, maybe this whole serving the Lord thing is for the birds. I'll try something else for some time. But this is what we find King Asa doing. Because King Asa was a man we find as he starts out his, his ministry there as the king of Israel, we find him. He is perfect in heart, at least to what we can know and understand of what's recorded here in Scripture. I mean, he's put out the, the, the religious and the moral reforms. He's done everything uh, that we can think of that a king ought to be doing or everything that he ought to be, establishing righteousness in the land and uh, executing righteousness and so forth. When it comes to being in times of trouble, I forget which wars that it was during his time, but he had some wars that were earlier on that he fought, of which he was weak, of which he didn't have the military forces, the finances, he didn't have the capacity to go to war. And you remember, he's like one of those kings who spread out the scrolls, just like Hezekiah. 
He calls upon the name of the Lord, and he says, Lord, save us. And, and because he relied wholeheartedly upon the Lord, the Lord did save him and rescued him. He was sold out for God, at least all until the last five years of his life. Last five years of his life, things were much different. He was a strong leader. He was a servant of the Lord. But I don't know what took place in the last five years, but pride got a hold of his heart. When confronted about his, his sin, really that's what it is, he began to get angry. This is what we see. In verse 7, Hananiah the seer, he's the prophet. He confronts Asa the king who went to hire out from other nations to come to his rescue and come to his protection. God says, why, why is your heart not perfect toward me? Why are you not leaning upon me? Why are you leaning to your own understanding? Why are you going your own form, your own fashion, your own way? What is the difference? Why are you going another direction, another way instead of resting and relying upon me? I would have the same sort of questions in my mind. But when Hananiah the seer begins to confront Asa with the truth of what God is expecting, he says, if you just be a, a perfect heart, then I'll show myself strong on your behalf. Just as I've rescued in the past, I can do it again today. I can do it again today. And so when I look at what God is looking for in a man, He's not going to look for a man who's wavering in his convictions. Not wavering in his stand on God and who He is and what He can do for him. He's not serving the Lord for some of His years and then for the last several years saying, well, you know, I've done my time and then that's it. But He's looking for a man who's wholeheartedly sold out for Him. And so I want you to notice the seeker. It's God. He says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth. It's God who's doing the seeking. All things are naked and open unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. And there's nothing that we can hide from. That we can look good on the outside. It's God who's doing the seeking. Men can do seeking all they want to, but God has a perfect way of seeking for men, his eyes, his omniscient, all-knowing eyes are looking for a man. Notice the sphere of the search. It's not just in Israel. It's not just in Jerusalem. It's not just in Judah. It's not just for this king. His eyes go through the whole earth. For anybody, the Lord is waiting for somebody who would just be sold out for him. So it could be you, it could be for this day, it could be for this age, it could be for those for our children growing up, just as it was for Asa back then. Sometimes we tend to limit God and put Him in a box and say, well, yeah, God showed Himself strong back then. And we read where somebody prayed, Hezekiah, Asa prayed, and God came to the rescue and delivered them. Well, guess what? There was such thing as uh, uh, Israel's seven, well, I think it was a seven-day war. I believe it was. And God showed Himself mightily strong. When Israel became a nation once again, 1967 was a seven-day war. Is that right, Brother Cook? Six-day war. And I added seven-day. Maybe they rested on the seventh day. <laughs> Six-day war, all right. But it's still happening today, right? We need to be sold out for God. This is what He's looking for. He searches the whole earth. The subject of the matter is our hearts. You know, many times when uh, I guess it was popularized by maybe Rick Warren, probably Robert Schuller before him, but the seeker sensitive churches where they go out and they survey the community and they say, well, what are you looking for in a church? And then they get all the results back and they, they conform their church to what everybody's looking for in order to get people into the church. Well, God never changed the standards. He's not lowering the standards to come down to where we are to say, well, if we just do this, I'll lower my standards maybe not to a perfect man, maybe to your idea of perfect instead of God's idea. No, He doesn't do that. The standard is 
always been the same. It's looking for a perfect heart. Again, not sinlessly perfect, but those who who just giving everything that they have and serving God to the best of their knowledge, to the best of their will, and the best of their ways according to God's Word, living it out for Him. So the standard of the search and then the significance of the search is to show Himself strong on our behalf. He can still do it today. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, I've mentioned it time and time again, that when we are weak, we find out that He is strong. Then the wholeheartedness for God will not have a love for money. How do we find a perfect man? He's not going to go and do as King Asa did and use his money to go out and buy protection. It's not a love for money. It's not a love for self. Not a love for the world. 1 John chapter 2. Not a love for pleasure. Not a love for praise. But a love for God. You know, always and continually seek God without leaning on our own understanding. So the first search is for those who are sold out. Henry Varley, a British revivalist, uh, he had a meeting with D.L. Moody. Uh, they give the details of it, and I'm not going to spare you of all of this. But he said to D.L. Moody on one occasion, he says, you know, Moody, God's just looking for a man who's just wholly consecrated to Him. And D.L. Moody said to him, and he says, by God's grace, I'm going to be that man. Have you ever done that? Have you ever said to yourself, by God's grace, I want to be that sold out man? Who knows what God can do for a man who's sold out for Him? And that's the point. That's the point. And then we see those who are steadfast. God is looking for another man. Go to Ezekiel chapter 22. The prophet Ezekiel. Another familiar passage, verse 20, chapter 22, verse 30. I don't know why I said verse 22, but chapter 22, verse 30. Now this is a sobering passage when we see everything that's taking place in Israel, how their morals have gone so low, and their prophets, their priests, and... This is, is a sad, sad thing when we look at it. But Ezekiel 22, verse 30, it says, And I, that's God, I sought for a man among them, that they should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me and for the land, that I should not destroy it. And then the sad testimony, but I found none. You know, God's looking for a man to make up a hedge, not just here in Israel, but... Uh, in our communities, in our church, in our homes. You know, as a man of my home, as a father, as a husband, I am to be this sort of man who will stand in the hedge and make up, uh, stand in the gap and uh, to be there for my family. When we look at the, everything that Ezekiel was up against, I think it's verse 28, maybe 26... Was it? Go back to verse 25. Look, look at verse 25 here in this chapter. It says, There's a conspiracy of her prophets. Now, there's much conspiracy theories in America, especially when you think about uh, John F. Kennedy and so forth. All these conspiracies are always conspiring about. This is a different sort of conspiracy. This is something that God already knows about. And in fact, God showed Ezekiel on one occasion. He says, Ezekiel, dig through the wall and look at what these priests are doing. Look at what these prophets are doing. They're worshiping idols and everything else. This is the sort of conspiracy that they've made toward God to, to convince people that this is really the Word of God and it's really not. He says, there's a conspiracy of our prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. And they've devoured souls. They've taken the treasure of precious things. They've made her many widows in the midst thereof. They've violated my law, verse 26. Her princes, verse 27, in the midst are like wolves, ravening to prey. They shed blood and destroy souls to get dishonest gains. Verse 28, her prophets have dabbed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them. This is what Ezekiel is up against. 
He's seeing this, this conspiracy of the false prophets, the hypocrisy, the lies, the, the devouring, the blood, the idolatry, the, the, the dishonest gain that's taking place. And God says, I'm looking for a man who can go up against all this is standing here in this the beloved city of God. That's a hard thing to do. When you see it everywhere. These are people that Ezekiel has grown to love. But even God's lost respect in these prophets. Well, I guess He doesn't respect any man, period. But, I mean, you know what I'm saying. There's no re respect for these people because they don't deserve the respect. God was looking for a man who could stand in the face of all this opposition that He was going to be up against. You look at several of the prophets and many of them would be cast into prison. Some of them, they would be threatened for their lives. Some of them would be tortured. But a man who would stand in the face of opposition, he was looking for someone who could honestly and truthfully say, Thus saith the Lord, and not mince the words, but stand as a strong and adamant stone. And God was looking for a man. It doesn't say that he was looking for an angel. But he's looking for a man. He's not looking for an army. He's not looking for methodology. He's not looking for sacrifices and offerings. He's looking for a man with an obedient heart that can speak the words, thus saith the Lord. We tend to think to ourselves that I'm just one person. I always like the illustration of the one little boy upon the seashore who's picking up the, uh, the little starfish and tossing them back into the ocean. And he says, well, what is one amongst so many? He says, yeah, but at least I saved that one. But he was that only little boy doing it. We say to ourselves, well, I'm just one person. Well, God can do a lot with just one person. Turn with me to Psalm 106. I'm still going to be here. You can hold your place there. But Psalm 106. I'm going to start in verse 18 and read down through for just a moment. 106 verse 18 says, A fire was kindled in their company, flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a molten image. This is recounting what take, had taken place there in the wilderness wanderings. Verse 20, Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, terrible things in the, by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them and get this, verse there. Had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach, stood before him in the gap, had made up the hedge, stood before him in the breach, to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them, yea, they despised the pleasant land and believed not his word. We, I mean, it didn't happen just on one occasion, but Moses on many occasions interceded and stood in the gap for rebellious people. God found a man in Moses. We look at the missionaries down to the history. Think of Hudson Taylor who went into the inland China. Think of Borden of Yale who in his short lifetime wanted to go to India. Lost his life. Think of Adoniram Judson to Burma. We think of John Knox in Scotland. We think of <laughs> Charles Spurgeon in England. Many, many, many people have stood in the gap in their generations. But he's looking for a man in this generation who will stand in the gap. The head speaks of a wall. It's a fence and it reminds us that if a wall or a fence has a hole in it, something can get through it, Right? When I was in the Virginia Army National Guard there, we uh, <clears throat> had a lot of riot control training. And uh, many times at Quantico, 
And soldiers, we would line up arm to arm, shoulder to shoulder. I mean, we were up one against another so that there was hardly any room uh, because we didn't want anybody breaking through the wall of, uh, of, the, of the soldiers. There with our baton, our riot gear, our face shield because people spit in your face and yell all kinds of ungodly things towards you. And uh, it's a demeaning thing and uh, it's, it'll get you riled up really fast. But they would teach us, they said, don't care, don't, don't I mean, block out everything that they say, don't even listen to a word they say. If they spit in your face, don't even look at it. Your whole objective is to keep that wall. If there's a break in the wall, they've won, they can break everything and, and come through the wall that you formed. Don't let anybody through the wall. Sort of reminds me even of the cartoon characters. You know, how many of you seen the dams that are built and uh, you know the water comes through this one little hole there in the wall, and you see like Donald Duck or Daffy. <laughs> uh, some of them try to plug it with their little fingers. The next thing you know, the whole wall explodes. This is what's going on. So man to stand in, in the breach here. Satan complained of Job in Job 1:10. And God had made a hedge around Job, but he couldn't get to him. Stand has the idea of being steadfast and immovable, doing hard stuff, being there when nobody else is doing right, standing up against the opposition, putting up with the mockery, putting up with the ridicule. Abraham interceded for Sodom, and yet he couldn't find ten righteous in the land. Then we see the sadness, but I found none. And we ask the question, who's standing in the gap in our home? Who's standing in the gap in this church? Who's standing in the gap in this community and in our country? You know, if anything else, our country needs somebody to stand in the gap. We're losing all our moorings. No faithfulness in the land. We're losing everything, it seems like. And if there's any place that needs somebody to stand in the gap, it's definitely our countries, but it starts first at our homes. Then he's looking for some servants. Go to Matthew chapter 25. This one doesn't explicitly say it like Ezekiel and like Second Chronicles. But in Matthew chapter 25, we see that God's still searching for a man. It's a parable that's been given. Matthew 25, where... The Lord has distributed some talents to some of His servants. He gives one five, He gives one two, He gives one one. And uh, He's distributed these talents and He says, I want to return and He's going to take an account. But what I want you to look at, just one verse, Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. As the Lord said unto him, the one that had the five talents, and said, Lord, I've gained five more. His Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what God is looking for. A good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Only the servants of the Lord are pictured as standing before him. Based upon their actions, three things resulted. It was due to their faithfulness. And what does the Bible say about uh, God's servants as stewards? Moreover, it's required of stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. The first two servants, they were faithful. I look at everything that they did. It seems like they've done it right. They, they have taken what God had given them. God had given one, or His Lord had given to one more than the other. One had five talents, but the other had two talents. But that didn't stop the man with two talents. He didn't say, well, I can't do hardly anything because I wasn't given five talents, and so I just can't work as hard, and I can't do as much because I haven't given as much. But when I look at these men here, when God had distributed to them the talents, guess what they did? They didn't sit around and say, well, how in the world is this going to work out? What am I supposed to do with this money? What am I supposed to do with these talents? You know what they did? They went out and they got to work. They started working day by day and, and night after night and hour after hour. I mean, they were diligent in season and out of season and, and, and they were just giving their whole hearts whether the, the, the conditions were good. I mean, anybody can make money when, things, when the conditions are good, right? 
But even when things were bad, it didn't say what the conditions were. Despite the conditions, despite what they were up against, when the Lord had come back, it doesn't say when He was coming back. It didn't say that He was going to come back during the times that were good. It didn't say that He was going to come back when the conditions were bad. It just said that He was going to come back and take into account. But these men were diligent about their business and serving. This is the kind of man that God is looking for. One who's going to be sold out. One who's going to be a servant. Diligently serving and, and, and doing what he knows is right. The good and the faithful servant. But there's another servant. There's a servant who did no work. We find out two things about this servant that he did nothing, and then he tried to justify doing nothing. I, I find there's people like that all the time. You hire them to do some job, and you know we see it there on the television stations where uh, I like watching HGTV sometimes. They'll come in and do this reno work, and maybe somebody like uh, Homes Make It Right, and they come in and say, what, what happened? Where did all this go wrong? Well, we hired a contractor to come in, and he didn't do what he said he was going to do. Did a shoddy job and left, took our money, and left us high and dry, and now we can't do anything about it. This servant didn't do anything, and then he tried to justify his actions, and, and it's just a horrible situation. Why did he do nothing? He had no vision of what he could do. Maybe that's, I, I really think that's a lame excuse. He might have thought to himself, well, what can you do with one talent? That's hardly anything. I mean, it's... You know, it's like trying to give you a car and say, try to go off to college and you can do this or something like that. I, I mean, just it's not a lot. It's, 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 he had no vision of what could be done. He had no sense of responsibility. That's one thing that I'm worried about. I, I don't want for my kids. I want them to have a sense of responsibility, a sense of ownership. I, mean, I want them to be able to go out and, and, and take care of things. When I tell them to do something, I want them to do it. I want them to have a sense of responsibility. I had no appreciation. That's what I'm going to be preaching about this morning when I get ready to, to preach in just a half hour from now. No appreciation for what has been given to them. No appreciation for the sacrifice. I mean, it was handed to them. Cost them nothing. And he had no concern for what might happen. He had a false security, believing that it did not matter. And he did not look for the Lord's return. Why did he justify himself? He had a wrong view of God. He says, Lord, you're an austere, a hard man. Your rules are too strict, they're too hard. Uh, he wanted comfort instead of work, and he had a wrong view of his situation. And the parable shows me that God is looking for a man who will be a servant, a faithful servant. And then they... God is looking for a man who is sanctified. Go with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, another familiar verse, but God is looking for a man, for a woman, for a child, for anybody who will meet these conditions. They're sold out. They'll stand in a gap. They are servants, and then they are sanctified. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. It says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father does what? Seeketh such to worship Him. For God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So God is looking for somebody, somebody who's going to worship Him. It's not in a place. This woman was going up and He says, Our fathers worshipped here in these hills in Samaria. You say we worship in Jerusalem. Jesus says, Time out. We don't worship here. It's not about the place. You can worship here in Samaria. You can worship there in Jerusalem. You can worship anywhere in the earth. It's about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It's about a relationship. So many people get caught up in the sacrifices and offerings and weren't true worshipers. God says, I could care less about your, your sacrifices. God owns a cattle upon a thousand hills. He doesn't need what you have to offer. 
What he's looking for is an obedient heart, a listening ear, an opening eyes, open hands to say, Lord, here am I. I'm here to worship you. Whatever form or capacity that is. What are some ways that we can worship the Lord? Anybody? It's okay. It happens to us all. Come on, get somebody to raise some hands here. Go ahead. Yeah, testimony. testimony. Amen. Anybody else? Faithful in prayer. I mean, it's more than just coming in the building on Sunday and Wednesday, right? You worship the Lord at home. You worship the Lord in the workplace. You worship Him wherever you go. But it's all about the heart relationship that you have with Him. And about worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Mm-hmm. Thinking about Samuel when he confronts Saul. And really this is where my idea comes from. Where Saul goes out to battle and he thinks that, uh, oh, well, Saul, Samuel, I've done everything that God required of me. Yeah, but what meaneth the sound of those sheep behind you? The bleeding of the sheep. He says to obey is better than sacrifice. And there's a search for a man who knows how to worship. The Bible says later on, I think it's John chapter 9 or John chapter 10, that Abraham rejoiced, Jesus says, Abraham, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, when Jacob came down, of course, into Egypt, Joseph was there, ruler over the land. He knew that it was time of departure was at hand. And he gave this charge. He says, I want you to bury me with my fathers back in, uh, I believe it was the land of Hamor, Shechem, up there in Canaan land, the promised land that God was going to give him. But it says this in Hebrews chapter 11, By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph, and he worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. I mean, God is looking for somebody who just say, Lord, I love you, I worship you, I give you my all, I desire to pray to you morning, evening, and night. I desire to give to you whatever I can. You've given to me so much. Lord, I desire to come into your house and to hear your word and to apply it to my heart and to live it out, putting feet to the feet into action. For James says, don't be just be hearers of the word. We have enough of that going on. But be doers of the Word. This is what God is looking for. This is what He's looking for in you. This is what He's looking for even in Maggie back there. For you to be sold out. For you to be sanctified. For you to stand in the gap for your home. God is looking for a man. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much for our time together. Lord, I pray You would just use these words to challenge us. And Lord, I pray You would just give us grace to do it. Help us to be the kind of man that You're looking for. The kind of woman that You're looking for. The kind of children that You're looking for. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Any comments, questions, anything you want to add? Second. Nothing. All right. Well, you're dismissed and pray for me as uh, I'm preparing for this morning's message.